أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين اللهم اخرجنا من ظلمات الوهم وأكرمنا بنور الفهم اللهم افتح لنا باب رحمتك وانشر علينا من خزائن علومك يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما my brothers and my sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. After the death of Sayyidah Zahra alayhi salam, Imam Ali took a very different approach to life. The man who was at the forefront of the story of Islam from the very beginning, the man who was the flag bearer in every battle, the man who was the brother of Rasulullah, the hero of Badr and Uhud and Khaybar and Hunayn and Khandaq, Imam Ali السلام, after the death of Sayyidah Zahra, disappears. You cannot find him in the history books. You'll find narrations detailing how he would assist the Khulafa when they were in trouble. And we'll get to that today, inshaAllah. But as the person who was at the center of the story of Islam, it is astonishing to find that the Imam cannot be found. For 25 years, you find in this time, Abu Bakr takes the Khilafah for two and a half years. Umar ibn Khattab takes it after him for about 10 years. And then Uthman becomes the third Khalifa, Uthman ibn Affan, for about 12, 12 and a half years. In this 25 year period, Imam Ali السلام, disappears from the history books. And we have to ask, Ya Ali, where did you go? It's quite astonishing that this man this epitome of Islam is no longer with us. And as much as we ask, Imam Ali السلام, doesn't respond until the last years of his life. Finally, after all the years of asking, where were you? And how come you retreated? And what did you do? He finally responds in a sermon, a very controversial sermon. Usually sermon number three in Nahjul Balagha, the book which is a compilation of the sayings and sermons of Imam Ali salam. This sermon is called the Sermon of Shakshaqiyya. In this sermon, the Imam tells us what happened after the death of Sayyidah Zahra salam, what he thought about the situation, and what decision he made and how he felt. He tells us in detail of his mindset. In this sermon, in front of Ibn Abbas, who was astonished that finally the Imam speaks about that time. He kept it to himself all those years. But finally he let it out in this sermon. As he let it out, he was interrupted by a messenger who brought him a letter. And as he went to read the letter, Ibn Abbas tried to tell him, Ya Imam, can you carry on? And the Imam says, the way that this sermon came out of me was like the foam coming out of the mouth of the camel when it is angry or excited. That's what shakshaqiyya means. It is the foam from the mouth of the camel. And this is the way that this, this sermon came out of the heart and the mouth of Imam Ali alayhi salam. It was a final explosion. Here, the Imam then says to Ibn Abbas that this foam has subsided. But from the words that the Imam tells us, we can see this heartbreaking, difficult and unfathomable situation that he was in. And what he did for Islam 
where he squashed his ego and put it aside and looked forward to what was best for the nation, for the ummah. And he begins. I want to read a few lines of it to explain it to you. He says, Beware, by Allah, the son of Abu Qahafa, who is Abu Bakr. He says, Abu Bakr dressed himself with it. He wore something that wasn't his. He's insinuating that he took the khilafa that was not supposed to be his or his right. The son of Abu Quhafa dressed himself with it and he certainly knew that my position in relation to it was the same as the position of the axis in relation to the hand mill. The flood water flows down from me and the bird cannot fly up to me. The Imam is saying, I was the pillar and everyone knew I was the pillar. I was like the axis. The birds won't fly without the axis. But here, he says, I put a curtain against the khilafa and kept myself detached from it. He veiled himself from the khilafa. He detached. He thought about it. He decided that he won't fight for it. As we mentioned, he did not even get his 40 men. Only four or five companions showed up. He decided ultimately that now he would put the khilafa aside, take it out of his mind. It was done. Instead, he focused on compiling the Qur'an. It was Imam Ali السلام, who was the first man to compile the Qur'an. He spent those days compiling the Qur'an and he wrote a detailed tafsir of several volumes and he ordered it in the order of revelation according to some reports and he brought it forward and he offered it to the Muslims and the ruling party but it was rejected because some of the ambiguous verses were now explained and he detailed names, certain names that perhaps were not in the interests of those who were ruling at the time to be exposed. In the end, they rejected the Qur'an, this what is known as Mus'haf Ali. This Qur'an, which Imam Ali Islam says, fine, he brought it back, he hid it, and it was carried through with the Ahlul Bayt. But we have not received it, unfortunately. How much would it have helped us to understand the Zawahir and the Bawatin of the Qur'an? But this was another disaster, along with the burning of the Ahadith. Imam Ali Islam's Qur'an was rejected in any case. So, in this sermon, he's saying now, Abu Bakr dressed himself with it. He's now publicly stating his opinion. And he says, and this is at his old age, in his 60s. Then he says, I began to think whether... I should assault or endure calmly the blinding darkness of tribulation, wherein the grown up are made feeble and the young grow old, and the true believer acts under strain till he meets Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Here he's talking about how the grown have become so weak. Those who supported him and saw what happened, they grew weak inside. And the young grew old after the tragedies that occurred to the Ahlul Bayt. And how the companions were all silenced. How slowly you could no longer be a companion or a supporter of the Ahlul Bayt. If you were, get ready to be ostracized. Get ready to be oppressed. Get ready not to have any place in the government or to be picked on or to be sidelined. If you supported the Ahlul Bayt, then there was a red light target on you. You were, to push, you were to be pushed aside. We have to ask, what happened to these companions afterwards? What happened to Bilal, who refused the bay'ah to Abu Bakr? And on the command of Umar, he went, migrated to Syria. Why does the Mu'addin, the one who Rasulullah used to love his adhan, why does he not show up anymore? Why is there no more adhan recited? after the death of Rasulullah and Sayyidah Zahra alayhi salam. We look at the companions, Ammar and Miqdad and Abu Dhar and Salman and how everyone now is silenced and sidelined. Here, the true worshippers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have to put up with this strain. 
the Imam decided it was better to endure. Then he says this very difficult sentence. He said, I found that endurance was wiser. So I adopted patience, although there was pricking in the eye and suffocation in the throat. You can imagine how he felt. You know when something is inside one's eye, how difficult it is to get on with anything. Even if it's something small, he said there was a constant, constant difficulty, pain in the eye that would never subside. I watched the plundering of my inheritance till the first one went his way, but handed over the caliphate to Ibn al-Khattab. It's strange that during his lifetime, he wished to be, to be released from the Khilafah, but he confirmed it for the other one after his death. Interesting. How come there's no election after the death of Abu Bakr? How come now he can pass it on? How come Abu Bakr can pass on the Khilafah to Umar? Can choose his successor, but the Rasulullah Prophet Muhammad cannot choose his successor? And then he says this line, which reminds us of the words he told Umar bin al-Khattab in the masjid on the day that he was dragged to give the bay'ah. He remembered it. It's been so many years, but he remembered it. He was 33 years old when it happened. He disappears until he's 58 years old. All that time, he disappears. Then he becomes the Khalifa for four and a half to five years. And here, towards the end of his Khilafah, he's telling us. Then he says, I watched the plundering of my inheritance. The first one went his way. Handed it to Ibn al-Khattab. It's strange. During his lifetime, he wished to be released from the caliphate. But he confirmed it for the other one after his death. No doubt, these two shared its others strictly amongst themselves. They shared its others. They milked it. The same way he told Umar, milk the other. Oh Umar, squeeze onto it today. Hold on to it today because it's going to be returned to you tomorrow. He remembers. He says the same line. Towards the end of his life. They held on together. And they took it. Here. The Imam continues. But then stops. Ibn Abbas wants him. To keep going. And he says. Never have I regretted. Not hearing the rest of a sermon. Like I did on that day. Imam Ali. Alayhi salam, he. He. Constantly, constantly in his sermon spoke about the importance of the Ahlul Bayt. How the Ahlul Bayt play a pivotal role in the deen of Islam. And the Prophet told us this, that he leaves behind Thaqalain, the two weighty things. Kitabullah, the Quran, and the Ahlul Bayt. Imam Ali Islam tells us constantly in many sermons in Nahjul Balagha about the pivotal role of the Ahlul Bayt and his duty as the leader of the Ahlul Bayt. And the Imam explains as if in an ideal world you could combine the spiritual authority with temporal political power. But unfortunately, this is not an ideal world. And the Imam did not have this temporal power. So he looked around and saw who were those who did have that political power. And it was this ruling party. At the end of the day, it was done. When it was done, the Imam remains the spiritual authority. As the spiritual authority, he still has a duty to guide the Muslims. And so he saw that to advise them is better. When they needed advice, when they needed help, the Imam was there for them. The Imam gave them so much sincere advice. And this shows the lack of ego that this man had. So much so, that there were some poets who would write poetry about Imam Ali salam and his oppression, stating that he was the closest to Rasulullah and he was doing ghusl on the body of Rasulullah when Saqifah happened. The Imam actually orders the governors of those lands to stop 
the poets from writing such poetry. And he says, there is nothing more beloved to us than the flourishing of this religion. The Imam did not want to stand in the way of this religion. He moved away from anything to do with internal conflict. He said it himself that the Imama, the spiritual authority, is ours. Whether it's offered to us and we accept it or deny it, it always remains ours. This is his spiritual authority. And it is not dependent on the political authority, whether we recognize the Imam or not. He is the Imam. His spiritual authority is constant. But in the political domain, it is, as Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq tells us, it's circumstantial. You have to look at the external circumstances. The Imam will only rule if the, if the external circumstances are suitable. But if they're not suitable, then he does not rule. But he remains the spiritual authority. Even though he believed he should be the one to be the one leading Islam, he saw who was politically leading it, who held the temporal power, and he decided to put the conflict aside and even to stand against any rebellion, as we're going to see in tonight's lecture. And in this way, he wanted Islam to thrive. Now, right after the death of the Prophet, there was a terrible disaster that struck the Muslim Ummah. Aside from Saqifa, people began to turn away from Islam. In the ninth year of the Hijrah, it was known as the year of delegation. Amil Wufud. Delegations would come. All the Arabs over Arabia would come, pay their homage to Rasulullah, pay their allegiance and go back to their lands. People now were coming with new tribal alliances, but Rasulullah was trying to bring them as Sahib al-Tanzil from paganism to Tawheed. Slowly, he is now trying to allow Islam to enter their heart. So many Muslims, thousands and thousands have become Muslim right before the Prophet passed away. So when the Prophet passes, chaos ensues around the Muslim lands. People now start to leave Islam and what this is called, a battle ensues where Abu Bakr squashes this movement. These battles are called the apostasy wars or the wars of Ridda. Now, we want to first of all just say that it's quite an overgeneralization to say that all of these people were apostates. The apostate is the one who was a Muslim and then left Islam. However, these were all coming in very different groups. For example, you had some groups who weren't paying their taxes. They didn't want to pay their taxes to the Baytul Mal in Medina and they wanted to spend in their own communities. But they were classed as apostates. And this, of course, is not an apostate. So you can't call them an apostate. But they were classed as such. And so they were now an enemy. Abu Bakr organized an army to go and do this, to go and fight these people. Some of them wanted to not pay their taxes. Others were annoyed that Quraysh basically had seized power again. Others wanted the autonomy to themselves. They wanted their own lands, a government within a government. Others remembered that, why is Abu Bakr the Khalifa? Imam Ali is the one that we paid homage to in Ghadir. What's going on in Medina? We don't accept this. Several different groups, not to mention that a lot of these people who would say that they're no longer Muslims, they never even had a chance to understand Islam. Who said that they had any time to learn, for anyone to teach them, anyone sent to them, to allow Islam to enter their hearts and minds? They had been Muslim, what, for a few weeks, some of them? It wasn't even an opportunity for them to come into the fold of Islam. So it's an overgeneralization to say people just start apostatizing. But in any case, this was a disaster because now there was chaos all over the place. Everything Rasulullah had worked to build over the last 20 years, it was about to collapse. Everyone was going in their own way. Here, Imam Ali salam, had to make a, start, a stand. And his stance was that he will put his conflict aside for now. He did not rebel. And that was his unified front against this movement. But 
Abu Bakr and Umar organized the military and had their generals and Khalid bin Walid was a main one of them and they would go out and squash these rebellions. Now Umar tried to send Imam Ali السلام, to be one of the leaders of these battalions as well but the Imam refused. He did not take part in any of the battles in the apostasy wars. Anyone who claims so does not know their history. They tried to say that because they want to prove that he gave bay'ah to Abu Bakr, but he didn't. In fact, quite the contrary. You'll find reports where even Abu Bakr try, is trying to offer a leadership to Imam Ali as a general in one of the battles. And of course, Imam Ali was a main general in all of the battles of Rasulullah. So you'd have him be the face of your government if everything was legitimate. But as he wanted to offer it to Imam Ali, Umar tells him, don't even bother. He won't obey you. Because Umar knew, because he tried to offer it to him as well, and Imam Ali did not accept. The Imam did not take part in any battle after the Prophet's death. Any battle. He did not sanction anything. The most he did was not rebel himself and advise them when they needed the advice for Islam to thrive. Now, one of the main incidents in these apostasy wars was when Khalid ibn Walid went to a man named Malik ibn Nawayra. He went to his village. Malik was a companion of the Prophet. He was a high-ranking individual. He went to meet him. And Malik was someone who collected the taxes and would send it to Medina. Here, he wanted to understand what's happened in Medina. What's going on? Before he sends the taxes, he needs to know what's happening. Uh, Khalid ibn Walid comes to speak to him and they negotiate. Of course, the Adhan is on. They come, they pray. And Malik tells Khalid, take me to Abu Bakr. I want to speak to him. I want to find out what happened. But Malik's wife was seen by Khalid. And Malik's wife was known to be an extremely beautiful woman. Khalid became infatuated with Malik's wife. Imagine. He became infatuated with his wife, so he accused Malik of being an apostate. Malik was not an apostate. Malik was trying to figure out what to do with the taxes. He wanted to speak to Abu Bakr, but he accused him of apostasy and he killed him. Here, even some people that were working under Khalid could not believe it and they went and complained to Abu Bakr. But not only this, not only this, not only did he kill Malik, even though he had just prayed and he was telling him, he protested, he said, I'm a Muslim, man, I'm just like you, I'm Muslim. But no, you're an apostate. Why? Because he wanted his wife. And he married his wife and slept with her on the same night, regardless of her idda. Now, of course, people were outraged. Even Umar bin Khattab himself was outraged. And he went to Abu Bakr and he told him, Khalid must be dismissed. But Abu Bakr said, no. This was just an error of judgment. Why? Because Khalid is a very reliable soldier. Khalid was very loyal. Khalid was with them in all the difficult stances. And they need him for what was to come, which I am about to explain. So here, we find that not everyone had to toe the line of the law. And then emerged this idea of ta'wil. This idea that you can accuse someone of a crime and you can kill them for it. And we see that with Imam Ali السلام, how his killers accused him, how Imam Al Hussein السلام's killers accused him and tried to justify their actions as if they were morally correct. Now, every criminal can bring an excuse to kill another person. In any case, a new chapter arrived in the era of Islam now. Now, the rebellions were squashed and the Muslims now had experience, a lot more experience in battle in their large numbers and they were once again unified. Once again unified as an ummah. Here, a new chapter begins. The chapter of the Futuhat, of the conquests, of Islam now conquering the world. What happens is that people think that the conquests, the Futuhat, were a way in which Umar and Abu Bakr did a great act 
to bring Islam and Tawheed to the world and show them. Show them the beauty of Islam and make half the world Muslim. But this is not the case. Because we do not recognize this as a legitimate war. Imam Ali -Islam did not sanction it. The Prophet, of course, didn't sanction it. Allah did not sanction it. But the Futuhat occurred. And they were not for Allah. They were not for sincere reasons to bring Islam to the world. This was an economic war. This was just like tribe pillaging a tribe, raiding a tribe, except now it was no longer a tribe. Now it was a whole civilization pillaging and raiding another civilization. They went in and they took over. Now the Muslims were very strong. You had 30,000 warriors on horseback. Unified, young, fresh, strong. They went up against the Persian and the Roman empires. Empires coming towards the expiration date. Thousand years old. They took them and took their wealth. Abu Bakr and Umar were telling the people, rise up, claim what's yours. Come out into the lands. Demand your shelter, your food. Demand your wealth. For so long, these Arabs had been drinking the water from the same river as animals and would eat any random insect. Now they're telling them to go and explore the world, to go and take them. But this is not our way. Imam Ali -Islam could not stand in the way of such a tsunami, this movement. When Khalid ibn Walid first went into Sham and came back with so much wealth, everyone was stunned and astonished. This could be ours. The Arabs now were going to conquer the lands. But who are the ones supposedly bringing Islam to the people? The same ones that were apostates last week. Those were the ones that were fighting. The fighters were the so-called apostates. It's like someone became Muslim on Monday. And then he apostates on Tuesday. And then you force him to become Muslim again on Wednesday. And then on Thursday, you make him the professor of Islamic studies at Harvard University. It doesn't work that way. How? If in some of the battles, you would have the general of the army teaching the soldiers how to do wudu. Wudu. Teaching the soldiers how to do wudu. They were the ones bringing Islam to the world. This was not a holy war. This was an economic war. This is what the conquests were. And Imam Ali did not take part in them. But he couldn't stand in the way. How can you stand in, such a in the way of such a movement? And this movement made Quraysh no longer just the greatest tribe amongst the Arabs or the Muslims. Now Quraysh was the wealthiest tribe in the world. It's scary, this thought. They own thousands of acres of land. They were basically like royalty now. Here, Abu Bakr and Umar became absolute legends. They became legends. Their stories were told across the lands. They brought the empire of Islam from a very difficult economic struggle for how many centuries the Arabs were under such strain. Now, they owned all this wealth. They took over the wealth of the Persian and Roman empires. So the apostasy wars and the conquests were two great victories in the time of Abu Bakr. Slowly, Abu Bakr approached his death within two and a half years of being their Khalifa. As he came towards the end of his life, he gave the Khilafah, he appointed Umar ibn Khattab. Now, at the death of Abu Bakr, he left behind his wife, Asma, and his young orphaned son, Muhammad, who was only a year or two old. Here, Imam Ali salam, in another great act, comes and marries Asma. And he takes care of this young boy, and he loves him, like his own child, and he raises him. And he says, Muhammad was my friend, and I raised him as my own son. Now someone might be astonished at this. What? 
Imam Ali married the wife of Abu Bakr? Yes, well, she was the wife of Ja'far, al tayyar the brother of Imam Ali first. So she was the wife of Ja'far. When Ja'far was martyred, she married Abu Bakr. When Abu Bakr passed away, Imam Ali married her. And you have to understand that when it comes to marriages in those days, they're not like these days, that you know you find your true love, that's what's supposed to happen, your soulmate, and you get married. That's not how these things worked. Rasulullah himself married Umm Habiba. She was the daughter of Abu Sufyan. She was the sister of Muawiyah, the aunt of Yazid. We don't have to go into too many details about marriages because I can be here all day. But this is not an issue. What's amazing about this is how much Imam Ali السلام, can be selfless and take care of this young boy. And this young boy grows to be one of Imam Ali's greatest disciples and inspiration for all the devotees of Ali ibn Abi Talib. And he grows, and you have to imagine the weight on his shoulders when he saw that his father had violated Imam Ali. That's what he believed. And he believed the first three Khulafa had violated the Imam's right. He was a Shi'i. That's what's so ironic. The son of Abu Bakr was a Shi'i. One of the greatest of the Shia. A true devotee of Ali ibn Abi Talib. As if he loved him as if he was his own son and raised him that way. In any case, Abu Bakr appoints Umar as the next Khalifa. Here, Umar has a huge legendary presence and figure, and he's very successful and very popular. And he knows how to handle government. And he now can be so influential upon politics, economics, and even the Sharia. Ah. Economically, Abu Bakr was dispersing the wealth a lot like Rasulullah did. He was still very equal in dispersing the wealth, aside from what happened right after Saqifah, with giving everything to Bani Umayyah and Abu Sufyan. However, after the death of Abu Bakr, Umar, he takes a different stance towards his economic strategy. Here, now, the Arab is preferred over the non-Arab. And the Qurayshi is preferred against the Arab, over the Arab. And the Muhajireen are preferred against the Ansar. And the Aus, the ones who paid homage first of the Ansar, are preferred over the Khazraj, the ones who did it afterwards. And the people of Badr were preferred over the people of Uhud. And the people of Uhud were preferred over the people of Khandaq. And this created classes now in the Islamic society. No longer were things run in the way that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi ran them in his time. Economically, there were classes now. You had the rich and you had the poor. And of course, if, if you're from Quraysh, you're from the rich. Here, Quraysh, as I mentioned, were now the wealthiest tribe in the whole world. Now, no longer do we see the slogan of the Quran that the most noble of you are the most God conscious of you. This was no longer the case. Now it's back into tribal mentality. Politically, Umar was very successful. He was very strict. But at the same time, he knew where his enemies were and he knew where his friends were. And he knew that there were certain people that he would not call into taking into account. Like Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan, who he called Qisr al-Arab, a king in his own right. He would defend Muawiyah. He would not see to it that Muawiyah would have to be brought before the courts of justice. In this time, Muawiyah was in Sham and slowly growing his empire and his wealth and his government. And he was left to do this. He was not bothered. He was growing an ummah within an ummah. He was taking over Sham, slowly growing in power, slowly growing in soldiers. And Umar let him do that and defended him and gave him a great status. When it comes to the Sharia, ah, we find several different innovations that Umar applied and was successful in applying. And the people followed him. It was almost as if he had a right to do this. In the time of Rasulullah, 
temporary marriage was practiced. In the time of Umar, it was banned, and whoever would practice it would be punished. He also took out some, some words from the Adhan, Hayyu ala khair al amal, took it away. And he put forward Al Salat Khairu Minan Naum for several different reasons that we won't get into. He applied Taraweeh in Shah Ramadan so that everyone who is praying this prayer prays it in Jama'ah, which was never prayed in the life of Rasulullah, which we know you cannot pray the non wajib prayer in Jama'ah. But this was the case with Omar. This was not from the Sunnah of Rasulullah, but he said that this was a good innovation. It's a bid'ah hasana basically. That's what he's seeing. Now, Imam Ali السلام, in all this time, even though he was detached, he would be someone who they would constantly go to when they were stuck. Omar would constantly go to Imam Ali when he was stuck to the point that he said, had it not been for Ali ibn Abi Talib, Omar would have perished. Because it's true, constantly Imam Ali السلام, was a source of guidance and advice as the spiritual authority, he never hid away from his duty. That's how selfless he was. All for Islam, without the personal grudge. Here, you find several different instances. When Umar wanted to go to fight in the conquests, Imam Ali told him, don't go. Look how sincere. He said, don't go. If you go and you're killed, what happens to the Ummah? What happens to the nation of Islam here? If the Qa'id, if the leader is killed, there will be chaos. It's chaotic. In your hometown, you have to stay in the center. If someone wants to say that Imam Ali wants to conspire to take the Khilafah, why did he not do that now? Why did he not try to send Umar into the battles? Instead, he is sincere in his advice because he wants the betterment of Islam and he wants Islam to thrive. We find in one instance, a lady is accused of adultery by her husband. She has a baby only after a pregnancy of six months. Here, Omar finds out and he orders for the woman to be punished. But Imam Ali interjects and says no. And he cites chapter 46, verse 15, where he says that the bearing of a child to his weaning is a period of 30 months. And then he cites chapter 31, verse 14, where he says, and two years was his weaning. And so he subtracts 24, which is two years, 24 months. He subtracts 24 from 30, leaving six months as a possible duration for the pregnancy. And so he saves this woman from the punishment. And of course, Umar then is going to say that has it not been for Ali ibn Abi Talib, Umar would have perished. During this time, Imam Ali السلام, was looking for another wife to bring him a child of courage, of valor and bravery, to be a brother to the two princes, al Hassan and Hussein. So he asked his brother Aqil, who is a genealogist, he asked him if he knew of a courageous warrior tribe in order for him to marry a woman from that tribe. So he told him yes. He told him about the tribe of Kilab and the lady from that tribe, her name was also Fatima. And so Imam Ali السلام, went to ask for her hand. Her father was very pleased and of course they were married. This lady took great care of Imam al Hassan and Imam al Hussein as if they were her own. In fact, even more so. She always preferred them over her own children. In any case, the reason why he married her came when her firstborn child was born. When this child was born, Imam Ali السلام, took him into his hands and the same way that the Imam opened his eyes upon the face of Rasulullah, this young baby opened its eyes on the face of Ali ibn Abi Talib. It was the first face that the baby saw. And the first voice the baby heard when Imam Ali السلام, whispered the adhan and iqama into his ears. Sayyidah Zainab السلام, asked Imam Ali, 
as she was maturing. She asked him, Father, do you have a name for this baby? And the Imam Ali replied, Yes, I have a name and a nickname for him. She said, What did you name him? And he said, I will name him Abbas, the one who frowns upon the wrongdoers. And his nickname is Abu al-Fadl, the father of virtue. And Sayyidah Zainab was very attached to this baby and was always with him from when he was a very, very young age. This young boy would grow and stay with Imam Ali السلام, the way Imam Ali would stay with Rasulullah. Everywhere Imam Ali would go, this young boy would follow him. 14 years he spent with him. Imam Ali would say, my son Abbas took knowledge from me the way the baby pigeon takes food from its mother. Imam Ali Islam spent that 14 years teaching him in akhlaq, in ilm and knowledge and of course in combat and raised him to be a great warrior, to always be there as the backbone for his family and his brothers. Now, towards the end of Umar ibn Khattab's reign as the Khalifa, he was struck and he fell ill because of his wounds. So he was now deciding on his successor. The first Khalifa became a Khalifa through apparently votes or an election. The second one was appointed. Now they're going to change the methodology once more. So there's no set methodology. It was trial and error. This time, Omar decided he would make a shura, a council of six individuals, put them in a house. They were forced to be in this house. And he had the Ansar guard them and he gave orders about how this was going to go down. Six individuals. These individuals had to choose one amongst them in a certain amount of time. These individuals were Abdul Rahman ibn Auf, Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas, Talha, Zubair, Uthman, Ali ibn Abi Talib. By the way, Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas, very interesting. He is the father of Umar ibn Sa'ad, the general of the army which killed Abu Abdullah al Hussein in Karbala. But leave that for another day. But subhanAllah, you see how all of this is connected? In any case, here, Imam Ali is amongst these other five individuals. And subhanAllah, in the sermon of Shakshaqiyya that I mentioned in the beginning of this lecture, he says, what happened that when I was first, there was no doubt about me being the rightful inheritor of the Khilafah and Imama. Now I am amongst these people. Now I'm one of these six. And he knew that this was a setup, that it was never going to be his anyway. Omar had made an order. The Ansar and other people were supposed to guard the house. The men inside the house, the six were not supposed to leave. They have to elect one amongst them to be the Khalifa. And Omar had ordered that if the minority disagreed with the majority, that they would be executed. If five choose one, and one disagrees with the five, he's to be executed. If three choose one, and another three choose one, then you go with the side that Abdul Rahman ibn Auf is on. He's the tiebreaker. So if there's a draw, Abdul Rahman ibn Auf is the one basically who decides who the Khalifa is going to be. If they can't choose, they all get killed. Now this is mind-boggling because Apparently, these are all Sahaba, and apparently they are all, according to some narrations of some people, they say that they're all granted paradise. And so, how are they all going to be killed? It makes no sense, very contradictory. But in any case, Imam Ali, alayhi salam, he knows that this is set up in a way that he will not get the Khilafah. And he even told Ibn Abbas afterwards that I was never going to get it. He said, how? Why? He explained to him. He said, because... Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas and Abdurrahman ibn Auf are cousins from Bani Zuhra, the same clan, the cousins. Sa'ad is going to give his vote to Abdurrahman ibn Auf. So Abdurrahman ibn Auf already has two votes here, you can play with them. And Abdurrahman ibn Auf is the brother-in-law of Uthman. So he's going to give it to Uthman. 
So you already have now three votes with Uthman. Sa'ad, Abdurrahman, and Uthman. He said, even if the other two, Talha and Zubair, even if they vote for me, we are three and they are three, but with them is Abdurrahman ibn Auf. So I was never going to get it anyway. So Ibn Abbas said, why did you then attend in the first place? He said, because I wanted to show them their contradiction. When after the death of the Prophet, they said, Prophethood and Imama cannot be in one household, cannot be united in one household. So how come I was part of the six? In any case, the votes began. And as Imam Ali said, Sa'ad gave it to Abdul Rahman. But Abdul Rahman waited. Here, Zubair voted for Ali, Talha voted for Uthman. So Abdul Rahman ibn Auf had the vote of Sa'ad and he could choose now between Imam Ali and Uthman. And of course, he would never take it himself because he would not precede Bani Umayyah, Uthman. So we have to ask many questions here. Why these six? Why only these six? What about all of the other companions? And why is Abdul Rahman ibn Auf a tiebreaker in the first place? What logic is that? Abdul Rahman here starts asking around. Every Arab would say Ali, but every Qurayshi would say Uthman. In the end, Abdul Rahman comes to Ali and says, Ya Ali, I will give you the bay'ah. Ubayi'uka ala kitab Allah, wa sunnati Rasulullah, wa sirat al shaykhain he said, I will give you the bay'ah. I pay homage to you and you will become the Khalifa right now. Khalas, it's done. As long as you say, I accept and I will rule on behalf of the Quran, on behalf of Rasulullah, and upon the seerah and the tradition of the two shaykhs, Abu Bakr and Umar. You know what that means? That means, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, Ashhadu Muhammad Rasulullah, and Ashhadu anna. Abu Bakr and Umar, Khulafa'ullah, basically. You are bringing now Abu Bakr and Umar into the Sharia. Now it's Allah, Muhammad, Abu Bakr, Umar. They were legends. Of course, Imam Ali did not accept that. Imam Ali responded, he said, I swear to Allah that I will rule by the book of Allah and the sunnah of Rasulullah. And of course, he didn't accept. Abdul Rahman did not accept this from Imam Ali. So he went to Uthman and said, Ya Uthman, will you rule upon the seerah of the shaykhain? Uthman said, I accept straight away. And so Uthman became the third Khalifa. Once again, it was taken away, the right taken away from Imam Ali. Again and again and again. Here we come to the era of Uthman ibn Affan. Uthman ibn Affan was one of the Muhajirin. He was a Muslim from the early days of Islam, the difficult days of Islam. He had been a Muslim for a very long time. When they came to Medina, he was part of the Hijra. However, he had less stress upon his shoulders than the other Muslims, because at the end of the day, he's from Bani Umayyah. So he was still widely respected and a proof of this is how he was able to walk through the streets of Mecca during the Treaty of Hudaybiyah. In any case, because he's from Bani Umayyah, he had this elitist type of mentality. So when they were building the masjid in Medina, the Prophet Muhammad is the hardest worker, as the leader is supposed to be, getting his hands dirty and building the masjid from scratch. But Uthman wasn't really the type to get his hands dirty and try to build a uh, building from scratch. Uthman once even tried to disgrace Imam Ali السلام, and tell him, you're the one who the Prophet left behind on his expedition to Tabuk. And Imam Ali السلام, responded, you're, you're the one who ran away from Uhud. In any case, Uthman and his character was not the same character as Umar. Umar, Umar was known as firm, strong, and he was very popular. Uthman, on the other hand, he was not as firm, not as strong. He had a weak character. He was dictated to by his son-in-law, Marwan ibn al-Hakam. So much that people would even say that Marwan was actually the non-official caliph. And that Uthman would be in the hands of Marwan, of Marwan the same way that a dead body, a corpse, is in the hands of someone performing the ghusl of the dead. 
that he would turn him whichever which way he pleased. Here, Uthman had a lot of favoritism and nepotism. He fired several of Umar's employees and he would place Bani Umayyah in all the high posts. Bani Umayyah became like royalty, the cousins of Uthman, the brothers of Uthman. He loved Bani Umayyah. Bani Umayyah now, Abu Sufyan was like a king. Bani Umayyah was royalty. A meeting of all the different governors was basically a meeting of Bani Umayyah. Now, the Islamic Empire from Kufa to Basra to Medina to Sham to Bahrain to Yemen to all the different centers of Islamic communities were all run by basically Bani Umayyah. They were the dominant factor and tribe and clan and their say is what goes. And the Umayyad Islam would try to advise him and tell him, Uthman, you need to stop doing this. Uthman, didn't you say they're going to rule the way Umar ruled? Umar didn't do this. Why are you doing this? And Uthman didn't really have the ability to stop because he was so conquered by those around him. He would say to Imam Ali Islam, yeah, Umar didn't rule this way. But how is Uthman going to change things here? He's giving everything to those around him. Even Aisha stood against him. Aisha, it's reported she wanted him dead. She lost her privileges in the time of Umar ibn Khattab and her father as the Khalifa. She had lost those privileges. Many people now are standing against Uthman. He was a very unpopular figure. Talha and Zubair conspired against him. They were enemies from all sides. But Bani Umayyah were thriving. In this time, many of the companions of Imam Ali Islam, they were silenced and oppressed. Ammar ibn Yasir, the old Sahabi, now an old man, the companion of Rasulullah, the one who Rasulullah loves, he had displeased Uthman and Uthman had sent for Ammar to be beaten. Beaten. Kumail ibn Ziyad was exiled from Kufa to Syria. But perhaps the companion who had it the worst in the time of Uthman is the beloved Abu Dhar. Abu Dhar, as this was all happening, he could no longer remain silent. He stood up against Uthman. He stood up against him. And perhaps the final straw was when Uthman asked a Jewish individual by the name of Kaab about a fiqh, a fiqhi question about zakat. He would ask a Jewish individual about Islamic fiqh and Abu Dhar had it. And he could no longer take it. You know, ask a Muslim, ask Ali Abi Talib, but why are you disgracing us? Why are you asking someone who is a Jewish person about Islamic fiqh and you're the Khalifa? You're not even a normal man, you're the Khalifa, you represent us. But he did it in an indirect way. He tried to make a problem with Kaab instead. However, Uthman was very sensitive. He didn't like to be approached in this way. And so he banished Abu Dhar into the desert, which everyone knew was basically a death sentence. He banished him to the desert to die alone. Here, he made his ruling. And the Imam Ali السلام, cannot stand against his ruling as a Khalifa. It hurt Imam Ali and it hurt Imam Hassan and it hurt Imam Hussein. In fact, they went to say goodbye to him as Abu Dhar was leaving on his exile. And Imam Hassan came to him and hugged him and embraced him. He said, my uncle. That's what they would call him, their uncle. He said, my uncle, I see what you're going through. And were it not wiser to remain silent, you would know what I would say. But be patient until you meet my grandfather. And Abu Abdullah al-Hussein salam told him, Uncle, you kept your religion safe from them and they kept their world away from you. How needless you were of what they had and how needy they are of what you have. They loved their uncle Abu Dhar. They embraced him. Imam Ali embraced him. And Abu Dhar left and went into the desert with his wife. And it's reported that he fell sick. He was with his wife. He fell sick and she was crying. And she was crying so much because she would tell him, I don't even have a kafan to shroud you in. And he would tell her, in his weak state, don't cry my wife. Rasulullah had once sat down with me 
and a few of our companions and told us that one of us would die alone in a desert until believers would come and take him and bury him and pray upon him. And he said, so, they had all passed away before today and none of them died in the desert. I'm the last one. So Rasulullah was talking about me and he was happy and he was waiting. And he said, just keep your eye out. Keep your eye out. And so she would kept looking outside and sure enough, she saw a caravan. So she started waving to the caravan. And the caravan came and she told them, my husband is dying. He's a Muslim man and he needs help. And they asked her, who is your husband? And she told him, Abu Dhar. And they said, Abu Dhar, the companion of Rasulullah and the leader of this caravan was a man named Malik al-Ashtar, who is going to be a main character in the lectures to come and one of the greatest companions of Ali ibn Abi Talib. Malik al-Ashtar gets off his horse and comes to see Abu Dhar in his tent. And he speaks to him and Abu Dhar tells him, Salamu alaykum, alaykum as-salam. What's your name? He says, my name is Malik al-Ashtar. And so Abu Dhar tells him, congratulations Malik. Rasulullah told me believers would be the ones to come and bury me. So you, by the standards of Rasulullah, are a believer. Soon, Abu Dhar became very weak and passed. Malik al-Ashtar buried him and prayed upon him with the companions and they left. They were on the way to Medina. They were on the way to complain to the Khalifa. Malik al-Ashtar had gone with his delegation because he was trying to create a movement to fix the wrongs that were rampant in the Muslim Ummah at the time. The chaos continued in the period of Uthman ibn Affan's reign and tensions were rising and as I mentioned all these different factors, enemies were everywhere. Uthman's love for Bani Umayyah had blinded him. His half-brother Walid ibn Aqba was leading the prayers while he was drunk and he vomited in the mihrab and he led the Fajr prayer as four rik'ahs and he even asked the people praying behind him, shall I do more? Shall I give more rik'ahs? This was supposed to be a high-ranking official in the government of Uthman and he was his half-brother. When the people went to complain to Uthman, they were punished, not Walid. When Imam Ali salam, found out, he went and he punished Walid himself and he would go to Uthman and tell him, Uthman, you need to fix this. You need to fix these issues. These are serious issues. The people are calling for a renovation of your entire system. You need to take into account what they're saying. But he would ignore the pleas of Imam Ali Aisha would hold the shirts of Rasulullah during the sermons of Uthman. She was protesting against him. Talha Zubayr would protest against him. Slowly, rebellions started to flare up. The first rebellion came from Kufa and Basra and was led by Malik al-Ashtar. Malik al-Ashtar stood up to the governor in Kufa, Sa'id ibn al-As. He stood up to him without fear and because of that, he was exiled. He had to leave to go to Syria. He had to leave his family, his wealth. So Malik al-Ashtar now was exiled. You see what happens when you have to stand up for truth? You have to be prepared to give up a lot. A lot of these people were heroes. They were calling for justice. They were calling for justice. Muhammad ibn Abu Bakr was the leader of the second rebellion that came from Egypt about a year later with about 600 people. He was fighting in Egypt at the time against the Romans. He was a top general and respected fighter, warrior and Muslim. And he came with a delegation from Egypt. They went and they protested outside the house of Uthman. And Imam Ali al would tell him, do you see the people? They're serious. And Uthman finally accepted and said, Khalas, I will do tawbah. And he went to the masjid and did tawbah in front of everyone. I said, I'll give you what you want. And the people accepted. They believed him and they accepted. So the delegation from Egypt went on their way. 
back to Egypt. On their way to Egypt, they came across another delegation that was supposedly sent by Uthman. So they went to stop it. It was very strange. They stopped them and they said, how come you're going to our land? Who are you? What are you going to tell them? To tell our people, to tell the governor in Egypt, the governor which was one of the employees of Uthman. They searched the caravan. They found a letter with the stamp of the Khalifa. And the letter said, this delegation of 600 people who are coming back on their way to Egypt, kill them all, execute them. It was a setup. So here, the delegation was outraged and they made their way back to Medina. And they went with rage and they went to protest outside the house of Uthman. Imam Ali kept trying to stop this rebellion from getting to a point where it was going to cause great violence and internal conflict. Imam Ali salam, always wanted Islam to be strong and not to be divided from within. So he tried to negotiate with Uthman. And he said, Uthman, what's this letter? He took the letter from the delegation. He went to him. Uthman said, I didn't write this. He said, is this your handwriting? Uthman said, no. He said, this is your stamp? He said, yes, that's my stamp. He said, how come? Where is your stamp? Uthman said, my stamp is with Marwan. Al-Hakam, his son-in-law, who by the way, Hakam, his father, was banished by Rasulullah and was brought back by Uthman. Even Abu Bakr and Umar did not bring him back, but Uthman did. He said, it's with Marwan. Imam Ali said, yeah, Uthman, you are the Khalifa. Why is your stamp with Marwan? He's executing pe people on your behalf. You have to fix this. Uthman here was trying to hold out. In the end, Uthman had to release his secret weapon. He called for... Muawiyah in Sham. Muawiyah was now a great power in Sham. But little did Uthman know that Muawiyah himself was a very cunning individual and wanted power. So what Muawiyah did is very interesting. Muawiyah gathers troops and sends a battalion to Medina. But he says, when you get to Medina, you stay outside of it. Get to a place where everyone knows you're there. But do not go inside. And do not act on your own accord. Don't think that you're going to act because I'm not there. I'm the present one. You're the absent one. Go outside and stay outside of Medina. And stay there. Until you hear from me. Here, as Imam Ali is trying to negotiate with Uthman, it looks like something may go well here. The people are protesting outside Uthman's house. Tensions are very high. But when Uthman finds out that the battalion of Muawiyah from Sham has arrived, he became stubborn. He no longer wanted to give in at all to any of their demands. When the people saw, now people were rising up from everywhere. When they saw that the, the, that the army had come from Sham, they thought this was the final opportunity. If the army enters, there's nothing we can do. Now, it's now or never, make or break. And they went and attacked the house of Uthman and went to kill Uthman. Imam Ali Islam had nothing to do with the death of Uthman. He kept trying to make peace. Not once, not once did he utter anything against this rising up, uh, Afwan, anything against Uthman in terms of let's rise up and let's go for his life or his head. Never. Imam Ali Islam kept trying to negotiate. But what happened was Muawiyah tricked Uthman. Muawiyah knew that Uthman would become stubborn if he found out the battalion was waiting. So he set him up. As soon as Uthman was killed, Muawiyah called his troops back. But not before he acquired the secret slogan, the slogan that he would now use to gain power, the slogan of Ya Li Tharat Uthman. We are going to seek vengeance for the killing of Uthman. All these people that wanted to kill Uthman now were apparently going to defend his name. And guess who would be the one accused of the death of Uthman? To be guilty of it, to be guilty of not bringing the perpetrators to justice, to have to fight wars on the premise of justice for Uthman. Who would be the one to have to deal with all of this? Ali ibn Abi Talib. The man who kept trying to stop it, 
who kept trying to negotiate with Uthman, who kept trying to have peace talks, now has to deal with this chaotic disaster. And the consequences that are about to ensue as in Sham, Muawiyah's behavior and power, his power was growing, his behavior showed that he wanted this power. Imam Ali saw this and now the Khalifa was killed by Muslims. This was a disaster. And Imam Ali, as usual, had to clean up the mess. Walhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa alihi al-tayyibin al-tayyibin.